Good morning, Frisco Bible. My name is Jeremy, if I have not gotten to meet you yet, and I have the privilege of uh, introducing our speaker today. Pastor Wayne has been on study week leave this week. He's working on an upcoming series, and also this morning he is preaching down at Grace Bible in Dallas, so he gets to share with our brothers and sisters down there, uh, and he will be back next week. But today we have Chris Legg. Chris has been with us before. He's a great guy. He is the lead pastor at South Springs Baptist Church in Tyler, Texas. He is also a licensed professional counselor. He's the owner and team leader at Aletheia Family Counseling Center, which offers counseling, speaking, and business consulting. Chris and his lovely wife, Ginger, have been honeymooning since 1993, and they have been blessed with five great kids. He has published dozens of articles on various topics on his website and a discipleship program for men, especially fathers, called The Gauntlet. Uh, if you want more information, we can get you websites to South Springs and Aletheia Counseling and get you more resources. Pastor Wayne wanted me to say more than just read a bio, and it kind of scared Chris a moment you know, earlier in service. But I have two things that I wanted to give more. One, last night I was talking to my family um, about, hey, we're going to have a guest speaker tomorrow. My little one, my 11-year-old, she's like, well, is he funny? We shall see. <laughs> um, the other thing, Wayne was very adamant that I said this. Wayne believes, Chris, that you are one of the wisest men he's ever met. And I can a attest a, a bit to that. Just earlier this service, we were chatting about this series because I get to teach in a few weeks, and we were chatting about the topics that are coming up. And he said, hey, think about this. This is what I've taught on that subject before. Think about this. And I'm like, wow, maybe we should switch. Um, <laughs> he is a wise man. So it is an honor to uh, get to listen to him. Please welcome Chris Legg. Thank you, sir. I had to comment first service on what a good-looking man that Jeremy is, obviously with the hair and the, I mean, just, you know, the goatee of, the, he's, he's rocking it. So um, we, uh, uh, I, I am excited to be here with you guys, and, and it's always good to be here, and, and I'd love to get to, to jump straight into some of this stuff, because we've got a lot to cover. Um, as we're talking about the specific conversation that we're diving into today, uh, following up from last week, so we're still in the series that's apologetic in nature. Apologetics is conversations about God with non-believers. And so it also encourages us, if those of us who are believers, it encourages us to hear the reason, the rational, the answers for some of the questions that our doubts plague us with as well. Um, last week, listening to, uh, to Wayne teaching on the problem of, of human suffering, which how about that for a 35-minute topic, the problem of human suffering? I was like, good, good luck with that when he got started. Um, a few years ago in a debate, we had an atheist come and, and stand on the stage with me um, one evening at our church, and he and I discussed and debated some different topics. And, and one of the things that struck me about the problem of suffering, which, which again will we'll weave into what we're talking about today, is, is that removing God from the conversation of the problem of suffering does not remove the suffering um, the suffering is still just exactly the same, except now you have to taken away the opportunity for them to be purpose or redemption behind that suffering. And so asking him the question, all right, so you're, as an atheist, you believe it's wrong that God allows, has us as humans in a world with this kind of suffering, or there is no God, one of those two things. I said, but you have kids. What do you tell them? So you brought the, hey, kid, I'm, I brought you into this world where it's immoral to bring somebody into a world with this type of suffering and hardship. And by the way, there's no hope for that to have any meaning. There's no hope for it to have any purpose. There's no redemption behind this suffering. Have a good life. Like now that seems abusive and inappropriate. Instead to say what, what as believers we have is to say, yeah, there's, there is suffering but there's the hope for redemption of that suffering. Well, as we, as we jump into today's conversation, the conversation is this. Are we phobic? Is the church phobic? Especially, um, I, I added in the word multi. Are we multi-phobic? Are we a, a phobic group of people, a frightened group of people? C.S. Lewis once said, in a fearful world, we need a fearless church. Fearless isn't my favorite word. I think it implies a lack of emotion. I would say a courageous church, but are we phobic or are we fearless? When we face fear, what do we do with that fear? Um, and so we've got a, a lot to do here. And speaking of phobic, normally when I teach a seminar on this topic, it takes between three and four hours. I got it down to 42 minutes and seconds this in the first service, and hopefully We'll shave a tiny bit even off of that in this one, but uh, I hope you're ready to listen. I'm glad Wayne has prepared you to listen to someone speak quickly. 
That's going to be great, a great advantage to you today. So I may not even uh, touch what your tolerance levels are. Um, especially if you're a guest, this may seem like such a strange thing. And I'm going to come back to that, this topic. Why are we talking about this? And especially if you've not been here before or through this series, and this is the one Sunday you show up, it's like, really, this is what they're talking about? We'll unpack that in a minute, why this topic, we'll get there. And then why me? Well, this is a very real question for us to answer. This is this question of what is the church's relationship to issues of sexuality in particular and sexual identity, which is really what we're asking in today's world, are we phobic? That's what we're asking. Um, Are we phobic? Are we homophobic? Are we transphobic? How do we engage with that? And then who am I? Well, Jeremy said I'm the pastor of a church. There's only one spring, by the way. It's South Spring. Uh, not, not, not everybody, everybody does it. We can't figure out, like, what is it that makes us want to add springs to that? But no, no biggie. The, the, um, and then, but you said Aletheia correctly, and that's worth all kinds of bonus points. No one says that right. Um, but I'm also, so as the owner of Aletheia Family Counseling Center, I'm a therapist and a psychologist in, by training, um, as well as through theology and to be a pastor. And so I get asked to speak on topics like this where we get this overlap. I get asked to speak on that kind of stuff regularly, and I'm glad to get to do it today with you guys. Um, I, I will also um, comment that uh, for those of you, the, the, especially the ladies in the room, it's, it's, it helps if you know a little bit about the guy who's up here talking, and it helps you understand that I'm a real human being. Um, this, is, this is my family, although it's a little bit outdated now. The, the, they're all bigger than that um, and, and a little further along in life than that. But but I have a, a great family, and we engage. We have to engage in these conversations with, with our friends and with our kids' friends, and 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 the relationships around us. Much less in the therapy world or in the church. Also, um, um, you know, suffering combined suffering can bring a certain amount of unity. Um, and and as we weave into this tapestry of understanding, I want you to know, like I I understand your pain. I feel your pain every. Every day at 1030, there's a giant billboard in my town at the radio station that looks like this um, because they decided, you know what they need in Tyler, Texas is finally some decent Bible teaching. That's what we need there. And so, um, so I get to drive by Wayne smiling. I wave at him just like I do the Pope at the Catholic church. I wave like, hey, Wayne. Um, and so, uh, uh, and, and by the way, Wayne is one of my over shepherds. He is one of the, literally one of only two men who I've asked to play this role in my life, who I go to for wisdom and insight, prayer, confrontation, and challenge when it's called for. And so, um, it truly is a gift. I tease about that. I, I truly is a gift to get to be here with you guys uh, and to partner with him, even though he um, bailed on this topic, I assume, and had me come speak on it because I'm expendable and uh, I won't have to be here next week. Um, and I, I do appreciate, so a few years ago, we had a guy come speak at the church who's an expert in, uh, in <coughs> star stuff, uh, to, to quote Sagan. And he, um, he brought a penny and held it out at arm's length and said, you the little, you hold a penny in just the top half of Lincoln's head, and you hold it out like that up against the night sky. And we have a photo of that amount of space from the Hubble telescope. And that this is what that looks like. And so this is the analogy that the author of the book that, that Wayne is, is using as a plan for this series. It's so good to get to peer through the telescope with you guys and to see that though the world is calling certain things darkness, the truth is there's a lot of light there. And, and it may look like a, a, you know, a tiny, tiny square centimeter or a millimeter of darkness, but the truth is there's tons of light in that. And we always have to remember that the world, as John tells us, the world and the world philosophy is always going to be about moving toward darkness. Um, in the church, it's the pressure that we face in the church that the American church and the Western church is facing, not the rest of the world, which is exploding, as you've been learning about the last few weeks. But in the Western church, is this is the, the metaphor that we use at South Spring is the idea of people keep coming in and they're like, oh, it's too bright. It's too, could you turn down the lights? Like, could you tone down the truth? Could you tone down the hospitality? Could you turn the lights down a little bit so I'll be more comfortable? And that's not the role of the church. It's not appropriate role of the church. But a lot of churches, half the churches, maybe two-thirds of the churches in the West are cranking the lights down more and more as if our church, as if the truth had a dimmer on it. And so they, they turn it down and down, and people are like, no, it's still too bright. I still don't want to come. It's still uncomfortable. And they finally, they just say, well, you know, we'll just turn the lights off, and we'll make no claims about truth whatsoever, and then you'll feel totally comfortable. And then guess what happens? No one comes. 
The mainline denominations, even in the Western world, are hemorrhaging people as, as, as churches that follow Scripture are gr- continuing to grow even in the West. Mainline denominations are dying. Their seminaries are combining. Their churches are having to combine. And, and we actually, at our church, we now do an 840 communion service every single week. So as a Baptist church, we normally, as a community, do communion. We, we practice the Lord's Supper four or five times a year. But now we do it every single Sunday morning because we have so many people who have left the mainline denominations and the liturgical churches. And one of the things they miss is the Lord's Supper with their community. And so every morning at 840, we host it for the 40 or 50 people who come early because they want to, they want to, that's a, a helps them connect with Christ uh, on Sunday mornings. And so that's, we're seeing that so much, it's becoming such of an issue. Now the claim is, with the uncomfortableness, the uncomfortable light, our churches are being pressured to turn down the lights. Is this the right response? Is the reason we don't want to turn off the lights, ask yourself, is the reason we don't want to turn down the lights, metaphorically speaking, is because we're afraid? Is it because we're phobic? Is that what it's about? Or maybe when they use the word phobic, they mean hateful. Maybe the truth is we just hate homosexuals or we hate transsexual or transgender or whatever word you want to put in there or whatever is going to come next on the LGBTQ plus, that whole worldview. Are we just phobic or are we just hateful? Is that why we don't want to turn down the lights? Because that's what's being said. If you won't turn the lights down for me, you must hate me or fear me. Is that it? Well, let's examine the claim. Here's a claim. The claim, the Apostle Paul, this passage that we're going to look at um, connected to this is the Apostle Paul writing to a very dark, amoral, and immoral city, the church in that city in Corinth. Paul says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful, or in the Greek, maybe just better. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by any of it. (laughs) Food is meant for the stomach and stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, that's interesting, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and also will raise us up by his power. So much of the series, this series, as y'all continue to go through it, is going to involve a lot of teaching like Jesus did that sounds like this. You have heard it said, but I say. And anytime you're involved in apologetics and you're comparing the worldview of Scripture to the worldview of the world, you get a whole lot of that. You've heard it said, but I say. So you've heard it said there's no such thing as sexual sin or anything sexual that's immoral except maybe consent issues. Is that hatred? To make that claim, the body is not meant for sexual immorality. Just to claim that there's such a thing as sexual immorality, is that hatred? Is that phobia? What do sexually what you do sexually is really up to you and it doesn't matter to anybody else, right? Well, Paul says, "Do you not know your bodies are a member of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? They practice prostitution as an act of worship in Corinth." And he's saying, "No, no." For it is written, the two will become one flesh, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Notice how Paul intertwines the experiences of the flesh and the body and the spirit. He intertwines them together. In his day, there was a powerful religious movement trying to forever divide them. The Gnostics were saying um, that anything that happens with the body is evil, and therefore uh, it's, it is, it's just immoral and bad, and we need to focus our attention on only on the spiritual, or even better, they were teaching what happens in the body doesn't matter. The body's irrelevant. What you do with your body has no effect on your spirit. Those two things aren't in any way connected. Paul says, no, see, none of the above. It is not merely common. The body is not merely common, and it's not trash. What it is is sacred. There's a spiritual treasure to the human body that that God has proclaimed as truth. The body exists at God's whim and is His. We'll get that in a minute. In fact, the claim gets more radical as he continues to go. Therefore, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Now, of course, sexual immorality is a sin against the community. It's a sin against God. That's obvious. All sins are that. But the Apostle Paul then says, listen, listen, there's something special about sexual sin, about sexual immorality. And that is that it not only is a sin against the Creator, but it's a sin against the creation. 
I would love to spend an hour unpacking what it means that we are created in God's image. But what a shame that we who are created in God's image want to then set up idols when we are meant to be the picture of God, that we're meant to be the image of God. It declares rebellion and war against the creation and the creator. The author of the book that we're looking at, Rebecca McLaughlin, notes this, as we saw, the Bible presents marriage as a one-body experience. A man and a woman knit together, I love this language, in a spiritual one flesh reality. Three claims right there in her sentence, a spiritual one flesh reality. That's a big deal. It's real and it's spiritual and it's flesh, it's body. Manifested and illustrated in the fleshiness of sex, we'll just leave that where it is, and manifested by the combining of two parents' DNA into one child, into each child. Paul is linking the physical and the non-physical, the material and the immaterial. Where do we call places where the physical and the non-physical touch, where the veil, to think in Gaelic terms and Scottish terms, where the, where the veil is thinnest between the reality of the physical world and the reality of the spiritual world? What do we call those places? Anybody? Want to guess? We call them Temples. Temples are where the divine touches the humane, the human, where those two things come in contact with each other, where the veil is the very thinnest. The, the Greeks and the Romans and the other pagans, they didn't necessarily believe that God's only dwelt in the temple, although the theology of the Greeks and the Romans was a little <laughs> weird to say the least, but the, that wasn't the concept. That wasn't even the concept for the Hebrew people who had a temple as well. More appropriately, probably if this is what's in Paul's mind, although not probably in the Corinthians' mind, is a temple. Now, the, the Hebrew people didn't believe that God only dwelt in temples. In fact, over and over again, God says that. I don't just dwell in temples. I don't, that's not who I am. And yet there's a symbol for where man and God, where the veil is, is narrow. And, and what is the Apostle Paul going to say about that, by the way? How has that changed? How has the theology of that changed? Check this out. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? This is, this is a big deal, the spiritual experience. You want to touch God? Engage with a human believer in the body, in the flesh. That is, that's where it appears. That's why, I, I don't know if y'all call this room a sanctuary or not. We intentionally don't. It's it, it confusing to people that we don't sometimes, so it makes sense. But we call it a great room because we don't want people to think that this is God's house, this, the room. It's not. It's okay that we drink coffee in this room because it's not God's house. That's, that's, it doesn't have to be treated as sacred. We don't have to wash it with holy water every week. We just, you know, during COVID, we sprayed it every week. But that's not the same thing, right? That's not incense. Why? We, we are the temple. It becomes a sacred room the minute one of us shows up. Just like the foyer is a sanctuary when one of us is there. And your bedroom is a sanctuary where you're there. This is, this is what it means, our bodies. You are not your, notice, by the way, how does this transition happen? How did we, whoa, 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 how did we become temples? Here's how, you're not your own. You were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. You have heard it said, your body, your choice, but I say God owns our bodies. And he's the one who dictates terms about how we engage with our bodies. He's the one who claims authority there. That's tough teaching, the fact that that is radical thinking, is it, it tells you so much about where we are as a culture. Are there rights and freedoms and obligations about sexuality or not? In other words, is there a God who has spoken, that's one worldview, or not? That's the other one. No matter what else we call the combat battle that we're having between the church who, who is attempting to follow Scripture and every other's expressions, it really comes down to that. Is there a God with the authority to speak, and has He spoken? Is there even such a thing as sexual immorality? Because understand, that's where the offense comes in. If I proclaim there is such a thing as sexual immorality, when it comes to sex, you can be wrong. You can be immoral. That is offensive. That's offensive if you don't want that to be true. That's deeply offensive. So you've got to explain my, why I'm being so offensive. Why am I being so offensive? Well, apparently I hate you or I'm phobic. I'm either afraid of you or I hate you. That explains it. How did we get there? 
Glad you asked. That's exactly the right question. Well done. How did we get there? Let me unpack that for you just a little bit. And I don't know, I'm going to do this as quickly as I can, but this is usually much longer. So a long time ago, when history started, the, the metaphysic, when you look backwards, when you look backwards on that metaphysic, a metaphysic is the way the universe works. It's the fundamental philosophical stance, the way the universe works the way creation works. The first one was pre-modern. So from the time of history beginning until the era of transition, the scientific revolution, the enlightenment, the uh, Protestant reformation, um, all these different things, all those things happened within a couple hundred years of each other. And that's what began the transition from what is called pre-modern metaphysic to modern metaphysic. Okay. So the pre-modern metaphysic is based, there's, there's, again, you can get a whole PhD at just this topic. So then we're going to do one very tiny part of the entire, okay? That's this. In the pre-modern metaphysic, there is an external source for everything. Everything. There's an external source. There's a source for truth, purpose, morality, art, beauty. Um, you name it, fate. There's an external source outside of human beings. Something outside of us that tells us all those things. That's the idea. The name of my counseling center, aletheia, is the Greek word for truth. It, it, uh, it literally means covered, ah. Uh. So, ah, uh, covered, ah, uh, hidden, meaning not hidden, no longer hidden. That's the idea of truth. The Greeks understood that truth is something outside of us that has to be discovered, that has to be learned. We don't create truth. Now, you're thinking, some of you are going, well, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. But you need to understand, 60, 70% of our culture today disagrees with that statement. They believe truth is what I declaim it to be. That's how you get a phrase like, my truth. I knew you would know it. My truth. Okay, one of those two words doesn't mean what you think it means. I don't know, I don't know which one you're getting wrong, but you're getting one of them wrong. There's no such thing in a rational worldview for that. You end up with this concept, so, so let me keep going. So in, in, in modernism, the transition began to happen like this. There are some things external, and there's some things internal. Understand, for the, for the pre-modern, when they read that passage that, that gives you heartburn when you read it, when it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, and you're like, oh, I don't like that. Oh, I don't, I don't like the idea of God. God's going to punish Pharaoh for, because Pharaoh's rebellious against God, but he's rebellious because God hardened his heart. Oh, I don't like that. Understand for the pre-modern, the part of that passage that's confusing for them is when it says, and Pharaoh hardened his heart. That's the pre-modern one of going like, whoa, 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 hold on. Where's God in that? You can't just have Pharaoh doing that on his own. Where's God in the hardening of his heart? That would have been their perspective. Same passage they would have been really uh, freaked out by, but in the opposite way, okay? So, so then in modernism, the transition is there's some things that are internal and some things that are external. Some things come from the outside, but there's some things that come from the inside. And, and, and Christianity kind of, uh, modern Christianity has a lot of roots in, in, uh, in modernism, modern thought, the modern church thought does. And so, and so it's natural for us that we could debate some of those. We could debate who's the best band of the 1960s, and you wouldn't go, well, you're just wrong. Sorry, you're just wrong. I mean, abstractly, objectively, disinterestedly, you're just wrong. You don't know anything about music. Like you would go, well, I mean, that's what you like. Because we would say, well, some things are internal and some things are external. The phrase, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, is a modern statement. Pre-moderns would never have said that. No, beauty is what God says it is. So, so you get this. Now, here's, you can imagine what happens as you start getting this transition. More internal, less external. Some things come from inside of us. Some things come from outside of us. And more and more of it's internal and less and less of it is external. When you hit the midpoint and then you go 1% past, you have something called humanism. Humanism is the belief that man, humans, are the, are the fundamental source of all things. In fact, you eventually get to where everything has an internal source and nothing has an external source. And that's called postmodern thought. Creative, isn't it? Uh, the name? I don't know what they're going to do next. Like, I think you painted yourself into a corner, but it is postmodern now to go post. That's postmodern. That's where you get these two terms, radical autonomy or expressive individualism. Listen, who gets to tell me about me? Me and no one else. There is no God to say anything about me. My parents can't tell me about me. My community can't tell me about me. I mean, 
All these fail, but that's what we claim, right? No, the, the, my genetics can't even tell me about me. Only me, my own consciousness. I don't know how my own genetics became an external source, but they are. Um, and so I only, only me can tell me about me. That's called expressive individual, and I need to express that, and you need to accept that. You need to accept that that's true, and when you won't accept my terms for this, you must, I have to explain that away, you must be afraid or hateful. Those are the only reasons why you would not accept my radical autonomy, that no one can speak about me but me. We're the only source of information that is meaningful to us. In other words, the progressive secular worldview, what I try to call crowd modern, that's I'm trying to help out there, crowd modern in, the, in my writings, we place ourselves in the position of definer, creator, sustainer, moral legislator, redeemer, that one's especially true in regards to the uh, progressive race theories, and judge. Throughout all of human history, there's been a name for that kind of religion. It's called idolatry. Idolatry is when you give something other than God the authority, stance, standards, and power of God. That's what that's called. What does the, what does the Apostle Peter say about this so much later? Thank you, guys. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. What a great phrase that we don't have time to deal with. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they, the, the original doesn't say cancel. Sorry, that's a, that's a Chris Legg version. And they cancel you. They shut you down. They mock you. They don't get it. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait, wait. So when I tell you that you need to do it this way and you go, mm, I'm not convinced. They go, wait, what? How offensive. What's wrong with you that you're not accepting my autonomy, my version of reality, no matter how delusional it might be, you need to accept that it's true for me. Because see, truth comes from the inside. And in a discussion with someone like this, you will say, no, no, I, I think this is objectively morally wrong. And they will say, why have you chosen to be so bigoted? Like, I, don't, I didn't choose it. I'm just obeying it. I'm following it. Listen, I, didn't, I didn't choose, as all of my math teachers will tell you, math. I just do what you tell me to do, right? Like, don't, don't try to explain to me why A squared plus B squared equals C squared. I know you're making that stuff up. I know you just pulled that out of thin air. Just tell me what to do. I'll write it down. You give me a, you give me a decent grade. And we'll, well, that's a contract that we've got, right? I don't have to understand this. I just need to give you the answer you want, and we're all happy about it. This is what the, so all the way back, following other gods is always like scary to scriptural teachers, but, but idolatry is mocked. The customs of the people are vanity. A tree from the forest is cut down and worked with an ax. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fast it with hammer and nails so that it can't move. Listen to this. Look at that verse. Does this just drip with contempt and sarcasm? Their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field. I don't know what all that means, but I can tell. Jeremiah's like, what is wrong with you people? They cannot speak. They have to be carried. They can't even walk. They are stupid and foolish. The instructions of idols is wood, right? Why are you listening to a block of wood? You're the one who put the wood there. You cut down the wood. Isaiah, God mocks this harshly in Isaiah 44. God creates this little narrative when he says, a man nurtures a tree, he cuts it down, he uses half of the log to cook dinner and warm himself, and then he carves the other half into an idol and prays to it to provide for his basic needs. You know, like food and warmth. It's the same log. You just cut it in half and you're worshiping this half and you cook stew with the other half. This makes no sense. Now, worshiping the other Elohim, that's always warned against as, as truly great danger in Scripture. But idolatry is mocked by God. What could you possibly be thinking? Is there anything more foolish than trusting a block of wood that you carved yourself? Yes, there is one thing more foolish than trusting in a block of wood. Wayne referenced this last week. This type of thinking always ends up in the worship of man. You do you. You be you. And I don't know whether to be more offended by this line of thinking as a theologian or as a psychologist. 
So let me use the technical term here. To trust yourself is nuts. What are you thinking? Have you met you? Have you met any humans? Like, is this a new thing for you to look at yourself and go, oh yeah, trustworthy, absolutely. That's a, that's good. Any of you ever sworn before God and man you weren't going to have a second donut? Anybody? (laughs) Did you, in fact, later have a second donut? What are you thinking to trust you? What, how could that possibly seem like a good idea? You ready for a little pop quiz? Everybody on the, run, two, three, point north. Point north now. Yeah, I'm supposed to trust you people? Y'all are pointing in every direction. I think somebody pointed up. Like that's, that's not how this works. And you would trust humanity for this. What could we possibly be thinking with this? It is delusional that we would do this. Who do you trust? Are you, and you know not to trust yourself, and yet the world keeps telling you, no, no, you are the arbiter, not of truth. And you're going, man, I really don't think so. I, I'm checking, and all of my grades in school would indicate I'm not. <laughs> my Facebook posts would indicate, nope, not so much. I can be really, really, really sure of something and be wrong. Apparently, I've seen some of your posts. You can be absolutely confident about something and you're wrong. If you don't know this about yourself, you need to ask your spouse. They know. They know how certain you can be of something and still be completely wrong. And that's who we're supposed to trust in. It makes no sense. Well, then who can you trust? I recommend the God who says, trust me with this. This body is not meant for sexual immorality. It's meant for the Lord. This is what it's for. Listen, I know what I'm talking about. You've got a revolver, and I'm Colonel Colt. You've got a car, and I'm Henry Ford. Listen to me. I made this stuff. I invented this stuff. So he says, he makes a claim that there is such a thing as sexual immorality. You can be immoral and wrong about sex. How about that? We don't have time to unpack this much. We're going to fly through this. But the word that is used all through the, in the Greek New Testament and in the Greek Old Testament is porneo, which again, there's a lot we could do here, but I just want to ask the question, why doesn't Jesus, when Jesus or Paul, especially Paul, when he unpacks this, he creates a little list. Now, Jesus never makes the same list that Paul does. Why not? Well, because everyone knew what the list meant. You don't have to say it. If you're a first century Jewish teacher, a Jewish rabbi, when you say porneia, you are referencing Leviticus 18 through 20, especially 18. It's, it's, that is the, that's the reference. There's no reason to unpack that. They all know what he's talking about. And there are, there are some very specific limitations that God gives about sexuality. And apparently it's moral, not merely cultural, not merely um, political, and not merely um, ritualistic. These are a moral thing because each New Testament writer confirms them. Other New Testament writer, other times they will reinterpret Old Testament understandings for us as believers. These are never reinterpreted. They are reinforced as God's standards. You don't have sex within a time of ritual impurity. Maybe this is what Paul talks about in chapter 7 when he says, setting aside sex for prayer and fasting. Otherwise, it is. Sex is forbidden with a relative, with an animal, with someone of the same sex, or with someone you aren't married to. That's it. That is the limitation that God sets out there. Listen, these are the standards that I have. These are God's standards for sexuality. Jesus referencing porneo without unpacking it would be like me saying our constitutional rights, which thank you veterans for standing up for those and standing by those. If I reference the constitutional rights and later someone said, well, he didn't say anything about the freedom of speech. Like, yes, yes, he did. He mentioned constitutional rights and we all know what those are. When Jesus says, when he, when he condemns porneo and he just says that, he doesn't have to unpack. And, and by the way, by porneo, I mean these. Everybody knows what he means. So there is a claim being made. If God is authoritative and he gets to instruct us about sex, then what does it mean if I disagree? It means I'm wrong. What does it mean if I think differently? Then I need to mature. What does it mean if I just don't like it? Then I need to submit. Honoring God is more important than honoring my own flesh And honestly, it's not even my flesh. He owns it. And that's the picture that that creates the huge problem for us. So then why do we get this idea that, that Christianity is phobic? Where does that come from? If the truth is, we're just standing by the biblical claims, 
then why does it turn into the language of phobia or hatred? Again, well done. Excellent question. So as we jump into this part of it and saying, uh, back to our original question, after all, here's one of them. That one of the claims you will get, one of the two claims you will get is that we're always talking about it. That's the problem. We're always talking about this. If, if you're a guest today, you're going, right, see, I showed up one time and it's, you're talking about it. And, and so I ask, I, I mean, again, I'm assuming this is probably what we're in June, almost to June. This must be the, what, 10th, maybe 12th sermon about homosexuality as a sin for you guys this year. I checked with Wayne and he said, I think it's somewhere around zero so far. Unless it happens to fall into a passage, it's not something that we're, we're not hunting for opportunities, right? Um, for some of you, you're going, well, at least it's not talking about money because that seems to be what they're always talking about when I show up. But it is a, this is, this, this, somehow this is the unforgivable sin, homosexuality or whatever. Don't you hate how churches do that? Always bringing it up, whatever. And the truth is we're not. We didn't initiate the conversation at all. This fact is assumed, and you're told that it's true. It's called gaslighting. I'm going to teach you more about that in a minute. When you're told something is true that you know perfectly well isn't true, but you're told it's true over and over again, and you're required to believe it, even though you know, like, I, actually, you know what? I don't think we talk about this all the time. Unless someone asks, this is the conversation that happens over and over again, and it's, it's become difficult for me in my role because it comes out like this. Someone with this crowd modern, this progressive secular worldview, which is becoming dominant in our culture, by the way, we're, we're losing, the Judeo-Christian worldview has been the dominant one for 200 some years, in, in, at least in the Western world, actually more like 1,500 years in the Western world, and, and now it's transitioning for the first time. The dominant worldview is becoming this progressive secular worldview, and it's going to be tough because they don't have an ethic for uh, dignity. They don't have an ethic for tolerance. It does not exist. You either agree or you're a Nazi. Those are your only two choices. And that's the worldview we're about to be facing, as a, I think, as a church, which is challenging. But here's how it happens. The progressive comes up, and this has been happening for a long time. The progressive says some version of what you have believed about this, what you've taught about this for the last 4,000 years is wrong. What you've been teaching about this and have not changed your view on in the last 4,000 years, it's wrong. And we go... No, no, it's not. And they say, why are you always talking about this? That's the way the conversation goes. And every time it happens, I'm like, I didn't bring it up. I didn't. Listen, I'd love to talk about grace. Could I just teach Romans without having to spend a lot of time on? Could I just go through? And yet the conversation, they keep bringing it up. This is not a new issue. Some of you are old enough to remember things like these. These were the conversations Oh, what you believed about this for 4,000 years is wrong. Incidentally, by the, by the way, sometimes we have been wrong. Sometimes we've been, re, we've been interpreting Scripture incorrectly, and sometimes we have been wrong. Own it. Hum, be humble about it. We all need to. But everybody remember these? Hey, hey, what you believed about sex before marriage for the last 4,000 years is wrong. And we said, no, 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 that's right. And they said, why are you always talking about this? When we go, listen, kids need a mom and a dad in the home. They go, no, no, what you've been teaching about that, and kids needing a mom and a dad in the home, that's wrong. That's wrong, it's bigoted, it's biased, it's hateful, it's phobic, it's whatever. And we go, no, 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 it's actually right. And there's plenty of research to back it, and, and I think Scripture would indicate that that's the best option. And they go, why are you always talking about this? That's the conversation that's been happening. The next ones I hope you're ready for are age of consent and polygamy. Uh, polygamy is probably already a lost cause. That's, that one's probably going to just happen. But when it comes to age of consent, that's going to be the question. Hey, what you've been teaching about the fact that children, that we need to protect the innocence of children, we need to carefully introduce con big concepts like sexuality to them, that what you've been saying about that for 4,000 years is wrong. And we're going to say, no, no, it's, it's right, it's important. And they're going to say, why are you always talking about this? You, you phobic, closed off, hateful bigot. That's what's going to happen. So we need to be prepared for these conversations. Are Christians always talking about this stuff? Not in my experience, and I'm around Christians quite a bit. This is, this is, we talk about this when it's brought to us. So, in fact, I will comment. It's wild to me that we would be considered phobic or hateful when apparently we're willing to tear ourselves to pieces to try to figure out how to diminish the truth enough to allow people in, in certain ways. The truth is, not only are we not phobic and hateful, we're apparently willing to sacrifice ourselves on the altar of trying to figure this stuff out. 
It's amazing how this is happening. That's not phobic. That's not hateful. It may be wrong. It may be delusional, but it's certainly saturated with love. The desire that we want to figure this stuff out. I have never seen it. Churches are hateful. The second claim are hateful and unwelcoming to homosexual people or transgender people. I don't know about you. I've not seen it. I've just not. I'm sure it happens. I've not seen it. I've not seen that taught. I've not seen it expressed. What I see is scripture taught, and, and that is like the lights are too bright. So at our church, for example, we emphasize the difference between embracing or confessing sin. Listen, if you're confessing sin, join the crowd. That's all of us. If you're messing up, join the crowd. That's all of us. If you're embracing sin, that's rebellion. There's going to be a different relationship that we're going to need to have with you. My failure with pornography is not less sinful because someone else's failure with pornography is homosexual and mine is heterosexual. Does anyone teach that it is? I've not heard it. I've not heard anybody teach that. Is it a common teaching in your church that an affair, that heterosexual affair, is somehow more acceptable than a homosexual affair? Anybody ever heard that taught? Yeah, me neither. Because that's not what we're teaching. But the fact that we won't dim the lights about what Scripture says about some of these things, that is interpreted as phobic or hateful. And, and the problem is, in love, we have to speak the truth. The gospel comes in the form of love spoken in truth. I'm confident this pattern is the common one, at least in evangelical churches. We are not phobic. We're not really hateful. I mean, in individuals, I'm sure that exists. The concept of believing what you're told to believe versus what you know to be true is called gaslighting. It's really common in narcissistic relationships and stuff like that that we would say, this is a, this, this is a bad thing that we would say, you need to believe what we tell you, not what you believe. I'm not going to unpack that. You can look it up. There's plenty of writing about it. But the truth is that probably 98%, according to a recent research, 98% of people who are the main influencers in our culture are part of this not, not the culture, but the influencers, the 5,000 main influencers are part of this movement, part of this progressive secular movement. It's no wonder we think we're the oddball. It's no wonder we think we're the circus freaks. That's what we're being told over and over again. It's gaslighting. You're phobic. I don't, gosh, I don't think I'm phobic. Nope, you are. Who are you going to trust, us or your own reason, thoughts, uh, knowledge, eyes, and ears? We're supposed to believe us. And we go, I don't think so. We feel like the oddball. It's not the truth. Whichever convention is being dismantled that was put in place by the Creator because He loves us and wants the best for us, like a fireplace being dismantled and being told it's okay to let the fire loose in the house, it's going to be labeled phobic. Phobia, which means fear. We fear them, and that's why we say they're wrong. I don't think so. I think the problem is we trust God and we fear trusting ourselves. That's what we fear. We fear trusting humanity. We fear putting our confidence in people who are unquestioningly confident in themselves. That doesn't feel safe to me. I don't know about you, but I've met humans. What makes Christians a barrier, why we need to be labeled as phobic and hateful, is because we are not multiphobic. It's that we are monophobic. That's really the problem. The real problem is not that we are phobic of one thing, it's that we are phobic of another thing, and therefore less afraid. The truth is, as it says in Deuteronomy, by the way, I like the way the NSB translates this. It catches the, the sense of only. You shall fear only the Lord your God. We are, we're only thing we're supposed to fear, have, by the way, that we're saying, again, the Greek, now this is in Hebrew normally, but when it's translated into Greek, it's phobia again. The idea of reverence, a fear of, a knowledge of, a recognition of, even a terror of is possible. What, uh, what Paul says in second, second letter to Corinth, for we appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each may receive what is due for what he has done in the body. Notice that, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Oh, I thought that was phobic and I thought that was hateful. No, no, it's based on the fact that if something is coming and we want people to know it and we want to warn them. What we are known to, we, but what we are is known to God and I hope is known to your conscience. So let me wrap up with this. This is our last slide here. There is a God and He has spoken and we don't have the authority to overrule Him. We don't have the authority to overrule Him in our own minds and hearts. It is our constant prayer to have our minds renewed and transformed. 
And Paul says that's counter to us being conformed to the world. The problem with us is that we insist on fearing God more than mankind. And of course, mankind hates us for it because mankind wants us to fear them more. And so we're called phobic. Well, the truth is if they would call us, well, the problem is we're theophobic. The problem is you're afraid of God. We would go, yeah, that's probably accurate. That's the truth. Not that we fear him in terror. We fear him like a child fears a loving dad. Listen, I just don't want to disappoint him. I don't want to offend him. I don't want, to, I don't want the consequences that come from being on the wrong side. I want to be in agreement with him. We work hard at that. That is our constant prayer. So let me pray it. Father, we're so grateful for the power of your word. We're so grateful for your claim upon us. We were lost and abandoned. We were slaves. We were, we were un, unloved and unwanted. We were orphans. Our bodies were just, were just pin cushions for the world, and yet you have purchased us out of that. You've made us your very own. So Lord, I pray for your church, that we would not see the gates of hell as something that can stand against your church, but instead we would not be caught on our heels and put on the defensive, but recognize that your word is powerful. It is the anvil around which the hammers lay broken. Lord, the gates of hell are who is on the defensive, and the gates of hell will not stand against your church. Lord, I pray that we will be, as we're learning, and I, I don't have time to get into this, Lord, uh, today as we're talking, but I know Wayne's going to be talking about how we do this in a way that is reverent and honorable and generous and kind and loving not, not preachy, not, not in people's face, but Lord, I pray for a strength that we would recognize our confidence, our identity, our source, our value, our purpose, our treasure comes in you and from you. And I pray that our lives would be transformed to you and to the truth that every one of these people out there, even those who hate you, they are your creation bearing your image and you treasure them. And I pray we will pour out and love and compassion, the truth to seek to rescue them from their own trap. And Lord, I pray you would never let us fall in the trap of confessing the sin of other people's idolatry, but our own. Help us to examine our lives and see where it is that we've bought into this for ourselves, probably. Help us never to worship ourselves and to create you in our image, but always to accept that we've been created in yours. Thank you, Father, for this church. Keep the lights on. In your son's name we ask it. Amen.